Canada, bonjour, hi Canada, I'm Hugh Hewitt, inside the Beltway Live on this Tuesday, April the 12th in the year of our Lord, 2022. I got a note yesterday uh, from a subscriber to the Hugh Hewitt Show, Highly Concentrated Hugh Podcast, which is uh, this show, um, selections from this show, including the rundown, which begins every day with the news overnight, and then a couple of interviews and usually a throw-in like yesterday, David Mamet. Went for an extra half hour, and someone listened to the entire highly concentrated Hugh podcast yesterday, and I recommend it highly. I would suggest you subscribe to it, download it, get it every day, and if you miss the show, all or part of it, listen to that. And they said, your voice changed in the course of the show. I said, yes, that's just what happens when you swallow the pollen in Northern Virginia, uh, and so it clears out after about two and a half hours. So by the time of the program being over, now that Highly concentrated Hugh podcast is less than an hour in almost every case. Yesterday was a little bit longer because the Mammoth interview is too good to cut. But the normally it's 45 minutes to an hour of a three-hour show. And so, but it's different parts of the three-hour show. And therefore, and it's some after the show. So the voice, the, the pollen is moved through the larynx to wherever it goes. Raising the question, why did anyone settle Virginia in the first place? It really does raise the question... What in the world were they thinking? Now, I know George Washington lived down the street, and I know Jefferson was tired of riding from Monticello to Philadelphia and New York City, and I know Madison and Monroe were in on it too, and the big deal that's in the Hamilton, uh, the Room Where It Happened song, which if I had a producer, we'd come back with. But there really is an issue as to why anyone in their right mind would put the world's most powerful and beautiful city in this swamp. And uh, it always reminds to me in April and May, which is swamp season. Some call it spring here. But I call it, it's, it, it is Holy Week, so it's Easter. I shouldn't say that. A friend sent me all the Easter quotes yesterday. Our Lord, Jan Janura, who runs the Wild Adventure, to be specific, TWA.us. Our Lord has written the promise of resurrection, not in the books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. Martin Luther. The entire plan for the future has its key in the resurrection, Billy Graham. The message of Easter, this comes from a, frequent guest on the Hugh Hewitt Show over the years, N.T. Wright. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. Easter is the demonstration of God that life is essentially spiritual and timeless, Charles Crow. Watchman Nee. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. And then John Stott. We live and die. Christ died and lived. And then he ends with Martin Luther. Be thou comforted, little dog. Thou too in resurrection shall have a little golden tail. Not sure what happens to Dash Patterson. Come back as a producer when he's resurrected. He's back on the West Coast. He fleed the northern northern marches uh, where I'm installing a studio in the northern marches because no one can be in Virginia. You can't be in Virginia but two weeks in May. It's actually inviting. The fall is the time to be in Virginia. Spring is pollen season. Now let me do the rundown. U.S. and Kyiv warn of a new Russian offensive in the eastern Ukraine. Signs that Russia is nearing, this is from the Financial Times, signs that Russia is nearing a significant new offensive in eastern Ukraine mounted as U.S. defense officials reported the troops withdrawn from Kyiv and the surrounding areas were being resupplied, reinforced by the Kremlin for redeployment to the Donbass. Now, how bad will it be? Another Financial Times story has in it this paragraph, the paddle for the Donbass will remind you of the Second World War. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kolaba, told NATO leaders on Thursday last week, adding that he expected large-scale operations involving thousands of tanks, armored vehicles, and aircraft. Sort of like a Michael Bay movie for real, with real people getting killed and real disasters happening. And uh, we've never actually, we didn't have the technology to observe the the Six-Day War uh, or the Yom Kippur War, which were the last great tank battles of history, the United States invasion of Iraq in in 1991 and 2003 were great tank battles, but the Iraqi tanks ran away. That's not going to happen here. Also, uh, from the Washington Post, champion boxer turned Kiev mayor becomes a rousing wartime leader. Klitschko, who you've probably seen, is a legendary boxer and heavyweight world champion. He's running Kiev now, and he's out there on the streets getting people up. Ukraine has long been troubled since the collapse of the Soviet Union by rampant corruption, by their own oligarchy, by uh, thugs and mafioso types, 
my daughter went there on mission trips when she was in high school in the 90s. And they always warned about just stay out of a certain part of town, perfectly safe, but it's run by the mob. So they've always had corruption in Ukraine since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And they've battled it. My thinking is if they can survive the war with Russia, the new leadership that distinguishes itself by courage and by picking up arms and defending the country, that will end. They will have a renaissance in Ukraine if this happens. That is not going to happen <coughs> in Russia, where Sergei Beseda has uh, gone off to the prison where the Soviets used to send all their dissidents and, and people that they wanted to kill. Uh, he's been arrested, moved to Lefatorvo. Lefatorvo prison is typically used to house those suspected of treason. It was also used for torture and chemical uh, injections in the area of Bukovsky, the era of Bukovsky and Solzhenitsyn and Sarkarov back in those days. Uh, looking for a traitor of a tradition of sorts. They're, they're just going to, they're going to disappear, General. Colonel General Beseda. Uh, the U.S. weighs a shift to support the Hague Court as it investigates the Russian investigation. I'm all in favor of supporting investigation. We are not going to join the ICC. And if Team Biden uses the Russian war crimes in Bucha as an excuse to join the ICC, it'll be another reason. That's just a left-wing uh, scamp workaround. So we'll watch that very closely. New Allied commander headed to Europe. I'll ask James Stavridis about that later. Admiral Stav coming in later today. Uh, Army General Christopher Cavoli is slated to take that job. China uh, echoes Russia's alternative reality in its media around the world. Uh, I just posted a, a column, by the way, from the Isra Times of Israel. China's been giving away mugs in Israel. The Chinese embassy there has been, hey, have a mug, have a mug, to the diplomats who come to see them, the Israelis that come to see them. They're all bugs. They're all bugged. It's amazing. The Chinese are just amazing. Oh, did we put that in your coffee? We're sorry. Sort of like Dwayne and, and everything that he does to me. Oh, that happened? Sorry. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm looking at my mug. I've got an, an Al-Assad Air Base mug this morning. And I don't think it's bugged, but if it is, the people at Al-Assad Air Base aren't learning anything they don't already know because I'm reporting on them all the time. Macron and Le Pen are in a final sprint in the French election runoff. Generalissimo and I are going to France in the middle of this French election campaign. He is going to be for Macron. I'm going to stay above the fray. That's what, as many of you know, Dash Patterson's a liberal. And... In the first round, it was 28 to 23 percent Macron and Le Pen. And the leftist says, don't vote for Le Pen. I don't know that that's going to save Le Pen. I mean, Macron. I don't know. We will see. Welcome back to the old Pakistan. Uh, they tossed out the cricket player who was incompetent and stupid. And uh, I have people in Washington, D.C. tell me that Imran Khan is, uh, well, you think of Barbara Boxer. Remember what I used to say about Barbara Boxer and a box of rocks? Well, apparently Imran Khan would have lost jeopardy to Barbara Boxer. So they've tossed him out, and now they're back to the same two families that have run everything forever, and they go back and forth, and they're happy to go back to the back and forth. The military runs that country. Elon Musk is not going to get a board seat. Not going to get a board seat. Good. Great story in The Atlantic, which is in my Twitter feed, Why American Teens Are So Sad. I'm going to come back to that. And then I'm going to introduce a story that I'm going to spend... At, Coach Stefanski of the Browns is going to give the keynote speech to the poor Claires of perpetual adoration. This is why I like Kevin Stefanski. That's a Catholic's Catholic right there. If you go in and raise money for the poor Claires, way to go, Coach uh, K. Our Coach K, the new Coach K, Coach Kevin. Um, Stefanski over there with the uh, poor Claires. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I had two stories on American teens. Not only are they sad, San Diego's largest high school is cutting honor classes for equity reasons. You heard me right. The largest high school in San Diego County is cutting honors and AP classes because of equity. This is coming to a school district near you if you vote for a Democrat. And if you vote for any incumbent member of any school board anywhere, it's coming to you. Uh, I have one friend on a school board. Actually, the Orange County Board of Education is not a school board. It's a county board of education. Yeah, that's the only conservative board of education in America. But I'm telling you, they're coming for your kid's future because they can't hack it. I'll be right, meaning principals. I'll be right back.
endorsed Dr. Oz this week. I should say Jeff Rowe represents David McCormick, and I am reading from David Drucker's story, who joins me now, David M. Drucker, the Washington Examiner. Good morning, David. Good morning, Hugh. All right. Tell me about what was the president, the former president thinking? Why did he think it? And do we expect a double endorsement? And McCormick is going to win. I'm going to have Carla Sands on again, but I think, and Bartos on again. But stepping back, I've got no dog in this fight. It just looks to me like McCormick's going to win. Well, look, I mean, a lot of Republicans in Pennsylvania certainly think so, though not all of them. I talked to a number of Republicans yesterday in Pennsylvania. Uh, some think that this endorsement is going to put Oz over the top. Uh, many Republicans are perplexed, and Selena Zito, Zito covered that really masterfully in a story she published uh, yesterday for us at the Examiner. What I found was so interesting, Hugh, about this, and I, you know, I've now covered Trump endorsements. You know, if I if I had a nickel for every one of them, I, I wouldn't have to talk to you in the morning. And every time a Republican loses out on an endorsement, you know, I, I talked to the campaign and didn't get it, and they're whispering to me, and they're quiet. Well, you know, stay. He went too soon. He said he wouldn't do it this way. Uh, we can still win. I'm like, great, I want to report all that. I often know. hear, do you often hear, he uh, his former advisors are on the payroll of Candidate oh, X, and they bought it? That's my favorite. Well, my favorite genre is, this relates to that, my favorite genre is, well, you realize this really wasn't Trump's doing. He was manipulated <laughs> by a bunch of people yeah. around him. Yes. Great. This is a great story. Let's go. No, 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 no. We, we, can't, we can't talk about that. I, I don't want to get into it. You know, I'll, I'll antagonize him. And it's just nothing good's going to come from it. Well, in this case, McCormick and his supporters, you know, not just Jeff Rowe, one of his senior advisors, but his supporters in Pennsylvania, uh, they're, they were all very talkative. This was a mistake. You shouldn't have done it. We're going to win anyway. They didn't even hedge. And that's what was so fascinating about this. No hedging. And outright, you know, on the record declarations that Trump messed up. And so we'll see if Trump did mess up. But uh, this is, you know, to the extent that Trump, people in Trump's orbit were pushing for this, it was his wife and Sean Hannity. Um, a lot of people in Trump's orbit are on board with McCormick, and they were pushing for McCormick. Uh, but this is just one of those fascinating little vignettes about um People about the script not unfolding as it usually does, because normally people do not want to accuse Trump of making mistakes. They, they want to accuse a bunch of people around him of making mistakes, but never him. In this case, they're laying it on him and saying that he's going to have egg on his face. Did, did you talk to Sean about I haven't talked to Sean Hannity about this. I should try and call him up and ask him why he would endorse Dr. Rush. Sean's an old-style conservative. I did not talk to Sean about this. Look, I, you know, I know a number of people on both campaigns. It's not as though the people on the Oz campaign are not Republicans and not conservatives. Um, this is just a, in, you know, a difference of opinion. And in some cases, obviously, there are business interests, but this is, this is politics. It's not a big deal. And um, I'm not surprised that Trump backed Oz because Oz is a guy with a very successful television show who's famous and wealthy. And he's been friends, personal friends, with Donald Trump for at least a decade. Oh, oh, that that would make perfect sense if I thought he had a prayer of winning. I just don't think and he has a prayer of winning. This is a Republican primary. It's not a general election. And this may be true, Hugh, but Trump gravitates toward those things that impress him. You know, when I interviewed him, Decided when I interviewed him for In Trump Shadow, and it took me a half an hour to get him to, to address this question. I said, look, on the off chance you don't run in 2024. And he kept saying, what do you mean I'm not going to run? Why do you think that? I said, no, 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 just help me out here. If you don't run, what kind of Republican would you want to take your place atop the party? And I gave him some choices, a strong leader, you know, somebody who's steeped in the MAGA movement, whatever. He finally just said, I just want somebody that I like. And maybe that's a personal failing of mine, but that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> well, honesty, candor. Uh, in Trump's shadow, by the way, great book. People should read it if they want to get ready for 2024. David, quickly, I've been doing a story this morning on San Diego's largest high school cutting AP and honors classes for equity reasons. I think this, I think this travels. I think this puts on Nikes and runs from the West Coast to the East Coast. I don't think there'll be anyone in the country who doesn't know about this by the end of the week. What do you think? Well, I think it's, there's a very good chance that this story will have legs because it's not the first. It's just one of many similar stories. 
And I but, don't think that the people that make these decisions understand how parents writ large really feel about them. Oh, my God. They have no idea what they're going to run into when they run into the parent whose kid is looking to get into college in four years or just finishing eighth grade. And in this high school and other high schools where they're cutting AP and honors classes in Patrick Henry High School, they're screwing around with children's futures. And Democrats, may, they, stepped on, they stepped right into the trap of screwing around with children's futures. With masking kindergartners and all this stuff, I think it is the, the, the great white shark of 2022. And it's coming to a beach near you soon, David Drucker. Thank you, Drucker. Follow him on Twitter, David. M. Drucker, do you have a coffee mug, by the way? Drucker, uh, did yes. It, is, is it made by the Chinese embassy? The last time I checked, no, but I'm really, I saw that picture. I'm nervous. All right, just double-checking. If you've got anything from the Chinese embassy, run it through a screener. I'll be right back, America. Hour two of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Straight ahead. Morning, glory, America. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway. That is the sound of the education great white shark approaching the elections of 2022. And it's going to gobble up not just school district members, but Democrats everywhere because of stories like the one I did last hour. San Diego High School, the largest one, cutting all honors and AP classes. I'm joined by Byron York of the Washington Examiner. We, we clued in Byron, who might not otherwise know what's going on in San Diego Union High School. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, we gave him a little head start. Byron, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. Doing well. I have just two questions. One, why did anyone settle in Virginia? Because it's allergy season, and I don't know how they survived. Because they knew it was going to have a great wine industry in a couple of hundred years. Okay, that's a bet against everything. I thought it was because they had to smoke. But there's just absolutely no way to get through a day here without watery eyes and throat. Number two, what are they thinking, canceling API? After the COVID shutdown, after the CRT controversy, after all of this, how can even one principal much less other principals, do what they're doing to higher ed, to secondary education. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary and with, with these midterms coming up. You know, pollsters often ask this question, uh, which party do you, th- do you trust more to handle this issue, taxes or inflation or national defense or health care? And, you know, each party usually does pretty well on its own issues, Uh, The Republicans do well on taxes, they do well on national defense, they do well on border security, and Democrats do well on health care and education. And the Democratic Party, in the last two years, has thrown away the education issue, which, if you saw in Virginia, as you just mentioned, was a huge issue in in the governor's race. And now, the story that you point out, which is this high school in San Diego, which is getting rid of uh, advanced placement classes, uh, for quote equity reasons, uh, there's a there's a line in the uh, in the Union Tribune uh, story about it. Participation and success in honors and AP courses are key factors in college admissions. In other words, they're key factors in what parents hope for their children. Yep. And now uh, Democrats are getting rid of it. So the, in the bigger picture, you have Democrats by siding with teachers' unions by keeping uh, students out of school for so long with no reason uh, during, the, during the pandemic. And now by doing things like this, you have Democrats actually throwing away one of their better issues. They, they were good on education because they spent money on education. Right. And they spent money on teachers. And when you hire a lot of teachers, some of them can stratify and teach AP Latin or they can teach AP Calculus, or they can teach Honors English. They can get kids ready for college. But what they're doing is they're giving up. And I, I, I don't, I have no idea why anyone would do this, Byron. Can you put yourself in the place of that principle? Why would they do this? Well, the, I mean, the, the party uh, has obviously moved left over the years. Uh, certainly since the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, it has associated itself uh, with issues that don't have popu- widespread support, like majority support uh, in the country. And as you know, um, a number of colleges just got rid of um, uh, the SAT test over the past couple of years. And they did it allegedly 
for some reason connected with the pandemic, but some of them are probably not going to do it to bring it back. So one of the one of the things that the the left wing of the party has done is kind of fight a war against achievement, against distinctions based on achievement. And here You're again, on to something. You're on to something here. Keep going. Yeah. What I and what I said before is that part of parents want their their students to achieve. They want them to do well. And uh, again, from this story, the underrepresentation, and this is of uh, some minority students in AP classes, is a problem because enroll- enrollment in advanced courses is associated with a host of academic benefits such as better attendance, fewer suspensions, and higher graduation rates. If people have an incentive to achieve things, they achieve things. So who has an incentive, and I'm thinking out loud here, who has an incentive to uh, work against achievement-based indicia of excellence? That's a good question, because it's something that everybody pays rhetorical tribute to. Um, and if you, if you listen, if you listen to, the, to the people who are doing this, they will probably tell you they're doing it to achieve true excellence. Uh, so the, these words are, are, are used in every, you know, in every sense. But who actually benefits from this? I, I, I think the ad- Byron, I can the use nobody benefits. I'm going to use myself as an example. Uh, 12th grade, AP physics. Hugh Hewitt in the back row getting a D, a mercy D, because I didn't understand a thing. What? Yeah, because it was you know it's, I still don't understand a thing. And uh, we could be here all day, and you could bring me that guy who taught at Caltech, the greatest teacher, Fenman, Feynman, Richard Fenman, whatever his name is. You could bring him here and put him in the studio. I would never learn physics. So what do you do when you can't learn something? You screw around. And, and when you screw around, what do you do? You destroy the class for those people who are actually so inclined. I could have kept Bill Gates from doing Microsoft if I'd been in. You know, I would have been, you know, throwing things at him and tearing up his, you know, just giving him a hard time, doing what high school kids do. And I just don't understand it. Now, there's one group that I think is invested in anti-excellent measures. And that's high school admission, I mean, college admissions officers. The people who can't do anything go into college admissions. And when they get into college admissions, they, they make war on people they don't like and they elevate people that they like. It, it, there's, it's the worst job. If you tell me you're a college admissions officer, I don't want to talk to you. I really don't. I'm sorry if I hurt someone's feelings, but you know where I'm going with this, Byron. Well, you know, when you asked, what do you do when you can't learn anything, I thought you were going to say, you become a radio host. You do. Well, that's true, too. That, but you've got to be able to read. You've got to be Listen, able to read I'm, a lot. You know, I, I understand your, you know, your animus against college admissions officers, but I do think it's bigger, bigger than this. And it, there is this kind of war on achievement and war on excellence, which is, which is done, I suppose, for egalitarian reasons. Um, but it's not what parents want for their children, and there's an election coming up. You know, the egalitarian reasoning, that's the old uh, canard that in the French Revolution, everyone was going to be five foot four, and if we had to cut your legs off, that was fine. The rack and the guillotine made everyone equal, and that's what, you know, because God gave us equal opportunity but not equal abilities, and you can write a bit. You can push it out against a verb. Did you take AP Advanced English when you were in high school? Uh, no, I didn't, actually. And, and so when did you learn to write? Uh, when I worked in television, actually. I, uh, I remember actually being in graduate school and uh, being told that, that I was a pretty good writer, but I needed to, to actually grapple, uh, wrestle with the substrata of the text more. Which oh! actually took oh! the heart. Oh, well, I, know, I, took, I actually took it to heart and tried to to start, you know, stop writing facile things and then actually try to look at the evidence underneath something. Um, and I still do that today. Oh, so wait, you're not you were not caught up in a deconstructionist Dorada sort of. No. Uh, no, you you were just being told get to the bottom line and actually know your facts. That that was I think that was the point of the uh, criticism that I took. Yes. Yeah, well, I get that from Mike Duffy over at the Washington Post. Whenever I turn in a column, it comes, you know, he's old school. He says, what do you write this for? What would you write this I mean, an editor is a wonderful thing unless they're in charge of you. Then you hate them for a day, right? Then you like what they do. 
you like it when it's come out. You like yes. having written something. You don't like the process of. Doing you don't like, the, but but editors are a necessary evil in the world. They're like AP classes, because you got it. Other, what's going to happen to these kids who don't have an AP class? They're going to sit in the back of the other class, and be bored. Yeah, and and also you know one of the one of the problems with this is when colleges um, that are more difficult admit students who are unprepared for their curricula, then the students don't do well, become discouraged, drop out. It's a really bad process, and they could do better um, at another college and end up with a more successful life if they weren't pushed into an Ivy League school or a school that was uh, very, very challenging. Uh, and They and could fail. all go to USC and do fine, really. I've been saying that for years. USC grads do fine, and they don't, they don't go to class. I mean, it's just, Byron, very quickly, is Dr. Oz going to win? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Neither do I. What was he thinking? What was President uh, Trump thinking? It's a thinking? celebrity thing. It's a celebrity thing. That's it? That's yep. like a cruise line, Byron. That's not, that's it, not an it answer. It's a, it, yes. it's a cruise line. Byron York on Twitter. Follow him. Follow me to the next segment in hour two of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Stay tuned, America. Welcome back, America. That music means Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States uh, Senior Commander of Southern Command, also of Allied Strategic Supreme Headquarters in Europe. Good morning, Admiral. I'm mad at you. I'm doing great, Hugh. Is that a new globe behind you? That is. I, I got the globe in the picture because I liked it when it was in your picture. So I put the globe in. But the reason I'm upset with you, Admiral, is in the mail yesterday, the Fetching Miss Hugh and I are sitting down opening the mail and arrives to risk it all. Now, this is a pre-publication copy of yet another book from James Savridis. And the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt looks at me and says, how can he do that? He's just <laughs> as busy as you are, and you haven't written a book in five years. And I have no intention. I don't know. What are you doing? How can you turn out a book every six months? I fly on a lot of airplanes, <clears throat> and instead of uh, drinking bad scotch and watching a movie, I try and do a little writing. This is, tell us about this. When does it come out? I'm expecting the next successor to 2034 and arrives to risk it all instead. Um, yeah, the successor to 2034, which is called 2054, set another uh, generation into the future, comes out in about a year. In the meantime, I'd been working on this book, and the title tells it all, To Risk It All. It's about how we make decisions. If you think the three big things in our lives are our leadership ability, our character, and the decisions we make. I've written books about leadership and character, as you know. This is a book about how you make decisions under extreme stress to risk it all. Well, I am looking forward to it. What's the pub date, Admiral? Uh, 24 May. So um, Okay, up in, good. Uh, yeah, month, yeah, I will be ready by then. I, I will take it with me to Europe. Thank now, you. let me talk to you about Ukraine. Uh, I have in front of me a story from the Financial Times quoting Ukraine's foreign minister. The battle for Donbass will remind you of the Second World War. Uh, he expects thousands of tanks, armored vehicles, and aircraft. What do you expect? Um, I'm going to start with three magic words. I don't know. Nobody knows yet, and war is unpredictable. I think there are two possible scenarios in the Donbass. One is that uh, Putin actually digs in, goes relatively defensive, accrues the advantages that defenses have in warfare. You know, defense is to offense as three is to one. That's partly why the Ukrainians have done so well. So it's possible Putin will set up defensive salience. He'll pound the hell out of Mariupol. Now he's got a strategic line, a Putin line that goes from Russia down to Crimea. He may dig in, occasionally launch offensive maneuvers, but really dig in and say to the Ukrainians, come and get me. That's one scenario, Hugh. A second scenario to which the foreign minister is replying is plausible. Certainly we've seen indications. That would be another massive movement of Russian armor backed up by Russian air, possibly using uh, offensive cyber, which we have not seen much of in this battlefield, trying to degrade the Ukrainian command and control. So the short answer is, I don't think anybody knows yet what is exactly in the mind of Putin and this goon general he's put in charge, uh, the butcher of Syria, Alexander Dvornikov. 
No one knows yet. It'll be one of those two scenarios. It'll unfold in the next few weeks. Admiral, from what you've learned thus far, uh, if we see one of the giant tank battles that defined World War II on the Eastern Front, sometimes they spread over hundreds of miles and involve tens of thousands of tanks. Does the introduction of the handheld weaponry among the infantry uh, underscore what Senator Cotton said on this show? It's an infantryman's war, and you can't just roll tanks in anywhere. Um, I completely agree, and I have a piece, <coughs> out, piece out in Bloomberg uh, today about whether the tank will remain as, if you will, the centerpiece of that infantry battlefield or not. And I think the addition of these handheld weapons in great numbers, but also, Hugh, drones, particularly as artificial intelligence allows drones to swarm over tanks. Tanks could become the battleships, to put a naval context on it, uh, of the Second World War. Look, pretty useful, but by the end of the war, we're not building them anymore. You, you've seen the picture of the tank in the lake. It's sort of a yeah. play on the lady of the lake, of the tank in the lake, and I thought maybe that's it. Let me turn now to the new NATO commander, uh, and I can't find his name. I'm sure you know it. It's, um, of, course, of course I do. It's Chris Cavoli. Yeah. Chris Cavoli. There you go. See, um, I want to start by saying that uh, Chris Cavoli Vladimir Zelensky and Jim Stavridis have three things in common. We're all five feet, five inches tall. So this is okay. a great day for short people everywhere. Um, and uh, Chris Cavoli is remarkable. He is uh, a combat warfighter, of course, but he's also a foreign area officer, an expert who is fluent in several languages, including uh, speaking very good French, good Italian, and good Russian. Um, he is perfectly optimized for the job as Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, of NATO. And um, Chris was uh, just recently the four-star general in charge of all U.S. Army forces in Europe, a storied command. Um, Chris is also a kind, uh, smart, uh, someone you want to follow into battle but also someone you can sit and discuss the most serious ideas about the future of warfare. He's the whole package. All right, so that is good news. The head of special operations, another Army general, and I'm filling up in my inbox from Navy people who say seven out of the 11 combatant commanders are now Army. General Austin is just simply putting all of his buddies in charge of the, the Big 11. For the benefit of the Steelers fans, combatant commanders, they're in the chain of command. It goes from the president to the sec def to the combatant commanders. It doesn't go to the chair of the Joint Chiefs. It goes that way. And Admiral Stav was twice in one of those jobs. Should we be concerned that Big Army is now the big foot on everybody else's neck at the Pentagon? I don't feel that whatsoever. Again, I, I know Lloyd Austin extremely well. He's a rough contemporary of mine, about a year older, actually. I came out of West Point a year before I came out of Annapolis, uh, served alongside him in, in numerous uh, positions. He is uh, fair, sensible. He will put the best person in the job. And by the way, we currently have, I think, two of those 11 are uh, women. Um, he is picking the right talented people with the right background for this job. And the new commander of um, U.S. Special Forces Command um, is coming right out of JSOC, um, the Joint Special Operations Command, the three-star leader of our Tier 1 forces. That's the same path that Admiral Eric Olson went through. It's the same path that Admiral Bill McRaven went through. Um, these things move back and forth. I think uh, both these choices are superb. Have we been at a 7 out of 11 imbalance before, Admiral? We got four, now five. It'll be a wide tool space command, gets a combatant commander, I suspect. Who knows? But we have four uh, branches with claims to each of those. If you have 7 out of 11, aren't you kind of uh, tipping your hand on the future chair and vice chair? No, I don't think so. The vice chair at the moment is Admiral Chris Grady and uh, who's a surface line officer, a destroyer officer, commanded a destroyer in one of my strike groups. Again, uh, an officer who is perfectly optimized for the job he's in. In terms of the balance, I, I think it would be interesting, I suppose, to run those numbers historically. Don't forget, we have many, many more generals in the U.S. military than we do admirals. 
um, because the Marine Corps has generals, the Army has generals, the Air Force has generals, the Space Command, sadly, because Space Command should have had naval ranks, the Space Command has generals. Only the Navy and the Coast Guard have admirals. So there's going to be uh, fewer admirals. And by the way, constantly, Hugh, now you've never done it, but constantly I'll be introduced or even on, a, on CNN and someone will say, and now we'll hear from General Stavridis. Ah! You can't imagine how <laughs> tragic that is, having worked my whole life to finally become an admiral and be called a general. And, and yet we never hear about well, now we're going to hear from Admiral Petraeus. You know, it's, uh, yes. it's always General <laughs> So, yeah, that imbalance is, is part of life. Uh, might be mildly interesting to run those numbers. Um, I, w- I'll, I would I'll, like I'll, to I'll, know. I'll close, with, I'll close with one last thought on this, which is as we look at potential conflicts around the world, um, uh, particularly with China, South China Sea, a maritime conflict, I think you can make a pretty good case that we need a few good admirals alongside those generals. Well, that's where I'm going. The future of war fighting from an American perspective. We, we're Athens and Russia and China are Sparta. They are land powers. We are a naval power. They're developing a naval capability. But it seems to me we've got to adjust our budget from thirds and start imbalancing the budget towards our naval power. Does that have a prayer when the senior Pentagon leadership is 7-11 uh, tilted towards army. Um, I think it certainly has a prayer, and don't forget um, that entire process has many, many steps in it, not just the combatant commanders. Um, it is also, most obviously, the service chiefs um, who do the train, equip, and organize and are at the heart of these budget systems. Um, there is a secretary of defense who you correctly point out, former general, the deputy secretary of defense, Dr. Kath Hicks, herself is the daughter of a Navy admiral, a two-star submariner. And and again, these things come and go. When Don Rumsfeld was the Secretary of Defense, he was a former Navy carrier pilot. Um, Comes and goes. I think the the geopolitical, the geostrategic is what's going to drive this, not petty concerns about what kind of uniform people are wearing. Last question, though. If we have to make this change and we have to do it quickly, given where our competitors and adversaries are going, is it easier to get done when there is more blue in the room than than army combat fatigue? You know, I'd be a lot more worried about this issue um, 40 years ago as we were coming out of something called Goldwater Nichols, which you are well aware of. But as you always say, Hugh, for the Steeler fans, Um, It it was the congressional act that forced the services to jointness, meaning you have to serve in a joint command. And by the way, back to questions of fairness, I was the first admiral to be commander of U.S. Southern Command. I was the first admiral to be commander of uh, U.S. European Command and the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. So, um, again, it it goes both ways. Last bottom line, because I know we're wrapping up, the, the new triad of warfare, Hugh, is cyber, special forces, unmanned vehicles. Um, And that those missions don't care what your uniform looks like. And I think that's where we need to put our emphasis going forward. Well put as usual, Admiral James Stavridis, author of yet another book I've got to read, To Risk It All. I'll take it with me to France next week. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Thank all of you for as well. Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. The hope of Mitch McConnell to reclaim the leadership of Ohio of the Republican Senate majority and take over the Senate uh, rests on Ohio. We have to nominate a electable candidate for a tough general election race against uh, my friend Tim Ryan, who's going to be a formidable candidate. And Ohio's got five uh, Senate candidates left, and it's so tight, they're not even polling anymore. Jane Timken joined me, former chair of the GOP in Ohio. Hello, Jane. Good morning. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Thanks for having me. Uh, am I right? I have not seen a poll since early March. Have they just given up polling in the Buckeye State? Well, our internal polling that we put out last week shows me tied for second. Uh, This is a jump ball race, and this is about turnout and who's the best candidate to defeat Tim Ryan. And I am in a very good spot 
look, we've seen uh, some of my competitors display disqualifying behavior at debates. They've made some other disqualifying comments that are going to be very problematic in a general election. And so, uh, as you know, President Trump supported me to be chair of the Republican Party. I turned the state red. Your home area, Mahoning Valley, is now Republican. And I think that's quite frankly one of the reasons why Tim Ryan is running is because his district has turned Republican. And it's because yeah. I've been in the trenches fighting for these Republican principles, the America first policies of stronger borders, American manufacturing and talking about parents' rights and education. And my message is resonating um, and I feel very good. You know, I have the endorsement of over 200 elected officials, especially Senator Rob Portman, whose seat we are all seeking. He's looked at the field and he said, this is the best candidate to keep this seat. And so I feel very good about where we are. We're going to, we have three weeks left. We have a great team and I'm out every day talking to Ohio voters because I have done it. I put 150,000 miles on my car as chair and another 50 in this campaign. It's really important to get out and talk to Ohio's voters, to our families, uh, our farmers, our job producers, in our communities, because you need to listen to Ohioans because they want someone who's going to lead with grit and grace and get things done. And um, I'm the best candidate to do that. You know, James Timken, I'm always Warren oriented and Trumbull County oriented, but let me spread it out in the neo land. Uh, when you go to Canton and Akron and Cleveland, those are Democratic cities, but you got to go get every Republican vote you can get. Have you been campaigning in the Democratic strongholds as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, in Cincinnati, in Dayton, in Cleveland, in uh, up in Toledo, we are every uh, in every county. It's critically important to get out there. We have been all over the state. We plan on doing just that. Uh, uh, traveling uh, everywhere and doing events, back the blue rallies, parents first rallies, women for Jane rallies. Um, we've had great surrogates come in and support me. In fact, um, I'm going to have Senator Shelley Moore Capito come down into Southern Ohio and campaign with me. Um, that that's the West Virginia media market, and so that's a big deal. I didn't know that. I yep. did not know that. This is one of those things that people need to know about Ohio, that part of it is West Virginia. I mean, they just, they just don't know that, right? Right. And that's their media market. And she's endorsed me. She supported me. So we are all in every corner of the state of Ohio. And I just love it. Ohio is such a fantastic state, as you know. They deserve real leadership, not a bunch of blowhard show horses that we have in this race. Because they're in the So, place Jane Timken... I I often say to people, the last man standing in many races is the only woman running. I don't know if that still holds true, if gender matters in the uh, voting booth. Does it? You know, I, I think, look, I'm standing on my own as my own candidate. Uh, I think we've seen uh, another candidate in this race demean women, uh, make some uh, pretty sexist comments directed towards me and, uh, and women in general. I think that's problematic and, and disqualifying. Uh, look, women have a voice and I will be speaking for them, but I'm speaking for all Ohioans when I'm going to be in the Senate. It's critically important. And uh, I think uh, women candidates do very well, as we saw in the last congressional cycle, uh, you know, a lot of women one uh, Republican women won. Uh, Elise Stefanik is backing me as well. And so I, I, I think we're in a really good spot. Uh, Jane Timken, um, I actually have no idea which of the four candidates uh, took out after you. Who are we talking about? Oh, Mike Gibbons. He, he made a comment. I don't think Jane Timken's ever had a real job in her life. And then he made a comment about he wasn't sure if women had ever been oppressed, but maybe men were oppressed when they had to go to war. That shows you how out of touch and arrogant some of these candidates are. Yeah, shocking. Mike said that? Yes. Mike? Yes. Mike's the avuncular like uncle on the, you know, when I did the debate, I thought, oh, Mike's the nice guy on this stand. The rest of them have all got switchblades. So yeah. he did that? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, I got to get Mike back to talk about that. Um, Jane Timken, in terms of the general, um, you're right. When I went to Warren Kennedy High School, it was 70% Democratic parents, 30% Republican. When Tim went, it was 50-50. Now it's 70-30 Republican Democrat because it's Catholic. And Catholics have become Republicans. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Republican. It's a pro-life issue. They're concerned about their families. The Democrat policies are trying to destroy 
the family and Catholics recognize that. And, you know, I know the Mahoning Valley. I have the endorsement of Columbiana's uh, county party. Lots of Senator Michael Rooley, who's from that area as well, has endorsed me. Um, the people of the Mahoning Valley know me because I've been there. And to win Ohio, you need to show up and ask for their votes. And Yeah, this looks- is kind of inside baseball, but I want to ask about it. My, my grandfather ran the Ashtabula Republican Party in the 30s before he became a judge. And, the, you know, to run the Republican Party was a big deal. Are the people that you helped get into the chairmanships still there? Because that's a big deal on Election Day. Oh, sure. And, and, and that's why I have the endorsement of over 200 elected officials across the state, um, because they know me as someone who stood by them and fought for them. And just like I'm going to do that in the Senate, they looked at my leadership and they say, this is the person we trust to be our next senator. And that's going to be critically important on Election Day. And uh, it's I'm really excited about where we are. What is the sleeper issue? Is it fracking? Is it agriculture? What is it the water of Lake Erie that, you know, the other states want? What is the sleeper issue that national people like me who don't get back to the Buckeye State often enough uh, are talking about? I, you know, more and more I'm hearing about energy. Um, I was with a group of people last night. Um, Ohio is a huge manufacturing state. Um, people are starting to really recognize that our energy policies are not only failing us economically, but failing us in a national security standpoint. Uh, Ohioans, we have over 80,000 Ukrainians here. They recognize that um, uh, oh, uh, that said uh, that Joe Biden's policies uh, to make us uh, energy policies that are attacking our oil and gas industry. We have over 250,000 jobs here in Ohio related to the oil and gas industry. So people are waking up to our energy policies that the Democrats have failed us on. They want reliable, cheap sources of energy to produce jobs to go to the grocery store, and and they recognize it's put us in a, in a bad state in, in our national security. Your Twitter handle is Jane Timken OH. I just looked that up. What is the website, Jane Timken? Jane Timken for Ohio.com. Uh, F O R or the number four? F O R. Come join the campaign. Every every vote counts. Voting has started here in Ohio. I tell everyone huh? to get uh-huh. out and vote. Make sure you don't forget to vote on the May 3rd primary. And it's easy to go down to your county board of elections and vote today. So vote Jane Timken. Jane Timken OH and Jane Timken for Ohio.com. So voting, anyone in Ohio can go and vote right now? Yes, we are. We have 28 days of early voting in Ohio. Yes. See, I, I, I just want to underscore that because the whole idea that it's hard to vote anywhere in America is nonsense. It's very easy to vote. Do you need an ID to vote in Ohio? Uh, you, you do. You need your driver's license or a utility bill or some sort of form of residency identification. And they Jane Timken, do a great job. Thank you for joining me. Good luck in your closing sprint. I'm going to be talking with Matt Dolan coming up, and that will complete my final cycle through the Canada, Arkansas. Senator Tom Cotton. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Hugh. Good to be back on with you. Well, I am always happy when I can say you're too young to remember this because Tom gigs me about being old sometimes. But I like to get the senator when he's too young to remember something. Today, the Labor Department is expected to report that the Consumer Price Index rose 8.4% in March from the same month a year ago. Now, no one under 50 actually remembers this. I do. It's a nightmare. What do you hear in Arkansas, Senator? Um, Well, it's a nightmare to you. Uh, As you say, it's the highest um, inflation in more than 40 years. You're right. I I don't remember it. I was only four at the time. Um, (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) Anybody over the age of 50 probably does remember it, and uh, it's just making families very stressed and very hard to manage their monthly finances. Uh, when you see this month-over-month inflation in core staples like groceries uh, and gas, uh, to say nothing of, of things like trying to uh, buy a few toys for the kids or take them on a su- summer vacation as that season approaches as well, um, and it's all a direct result of Democrats' policies, Hugh. Um, you know, you know have- the early indicator of this, Senator, is that when my wife goes to uh, help my daughter out, who's going to have number four shortly, she wants to go grocery shopping. And that's because then grandma will buy the groceries. And that's always uh, that's what we used to do. We used to drive to Ohio to get food during the 80s because, you know, grandma would buy groceries. She didn't want the little ones uh, not 
<laughs> not it's, to it's eat. Good, it's, no, it's a, it's a good indicator, Hugh, um, and it really is a strain for working families and yes. families who are just starting just starting out. Um, and a lot of families are having to make very difficult choices. And again, it's all the result of the Democrats' policies. You know, we've had this pandemic for two years. We didn't have inflation like this uh, during the Trump administration. It's only once Joe Biden came into office. And Democrats started locking everything down and spending trillions of dollars that, of course, you got inflation. Yeah, you threw $4 trillion on the Barbie. And, and sure enough, it blew up. Senator, let me ask you about the uh, armed services budget, uh, because you're on armed services. There is a inflation number plugged in there that is risible. And so what are you going to do about it? They're not funding the military. They're cutting the military because they, they want to give more money away. Yeah, well, so, Hugh, just at the... At the nominal level, before you count for inflation, remember, they're spending more money on basically every department of government but the military, which is the exact opposite of what we should do. You should always start with what's most vital and most fundamental first. And for the federal government, that is the protection of our nation. We have to have a budget that match, matches our strategy that is suited to our threats, not a strategy that fits our budget. And then we can decide what we have remaining that we can spend on other priorities. But as you say to you, when you count for inflation, it is an actual cut to the Department of Defense. So, so just as last year, the Congress added $25 billion to the uh, defense budget that the President sent us, I suspect we'll do the same this year, maybe even more, um, as the threats have multiplied over the last year. Well, I'm worried about the enlisted uh, guy or gal who's down there at a private or a corporal rank and they're looking at 8.4% and what they call the exchanges of the PI. They can't, they can't live on that, Senator. You've got to raise yeah, Hugh, the... I, no, Hugh, I've, I've been in a situation where I've had young privates uh, who are struggling to make ends meet. You know, we have to find a way to get them a short-term loan or get them aid from the Army Emergency Relief Fund um, because something as simple as a radiator breaks um, or a refrigerator goes out. Um, to say nothing of the fact that when they're facing 8% monthly inflation, they can't even afford the baby formula anymore. That, it, it, it's, it's a genuine pressing problem. I know you're on it. Let me turn to Ukraine, Senator. Uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister said in the Donbass, we are going to see battles that approach World War II scale. Do you believe that? If so, do you think Ukraine can hold on? Um, I, I do believe that the battles will be of a different nature to you in the Donbass than they were in northern and northeastern Ukraine. That's because the territory over there is much less restricted, much flatter, much more suitable for combined arms maneuver warfare of the kind that Russia would like to engage in. Whereas uh, in and around Key, for instance, the um, Ukrainians had the advantage of more restricted terrain where light infantry could move using mobile weapons and strike their armor columns. The upshot of all that is Ukraine needs to fight a different kind of war in eastern Ukraine. They need different tools. Those tools are things like tanks and armored personnel carriers and heavy artillery. Um, we need to do everything we can to get those systems to them as quickly as we can. Now, they probably won't be American-made systems because the Ukrainian army hasn't trained on things like the Abrams tank or the Bradley fighting vehicle, but we need to assure our NATO allies who once were subjugated to the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact and therefore have old Soviet systems or other Eastern Bloc systems, that if they provide those tools to Ukraine, we can help them replenish their stocks. From open source stuff, uh, I read the Wall Street Journal story on the defense of the air that the Ukrainians mounted using a, a, a plaid quilt of machines and, and systems. Do you think they can hold off the Russian Air Force and, and maintain at least a fight in the sky, Senator? That, Hugh, I have no doubt that they can hold off the Russian Air Force and the Russian Army if we provide them with the weapons that they need. Um, the administration typically has been behind the power curve on this, behind Congress, even behind Europe, and that's not a good place to be. Um, they continue to worry more about you know, providing strategic off-ramps or improving Ukraine's position at the negotiating table. What we should be focused on is winning and victory in Ukraine. And that means Ukraine needs the weapons to fight their own war. We also see that the colonel general and head of the equivalent of the CIA has been jailed by Putin and that others are in it. What does that tell you, Senator? Um, well, it's not good for that colonel and those generals uh, yeah. <laughs> to have been high-ranking intelligence officers in Russia 
and to be going to jail. I think it shows there's a lot of dissension in the ranks, Hugh. Um, you know, the, uh, the FSB, their main security service, was primarily given the task of pacifying cities through a combination of subversion, bribery, um, and uh, tools of violence. Um, I, I think that there's probably, just like in any government, a lot of bureaucratic infighting leading up to this war. And now there's probably about who was responsible for what and who could accomplish what. Um, I think now there's probably a lot of bureaucratic finger pointing at why everything has gone so wrong for the Russians. Well, one of the stories I read is that they gave a lot of cash away with the expectation they would buy Ukrainian officials compliance with the invasion, and that didn't materialize. So they're wondering where the cash went. And maybe it never left Russia, right? Because everybody steals <laughs> everything. Well, it might have yeah, gone in those intelligence officers' pockets, or at least the share of it might have gone in those intelligence officers' pockets. Anyone who knows something about the Russian system wouldn't be surprised by that. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think it's a testament uh, to Ukrainian officials from President Zelensky on down to um, provincial governors and, and local mayors and security officials that they did not allow Russia to use its typical methods of subversion um, or in the early days of this war. Now, uh, Con uh, Senator, you are an Army vet, and I asked Admiral Stavridis this earlier. The new head of the Supreme Allied Commander in European Command is an Army general that makes seven out of the top 11 combatant commanders is Army. Do you worry that that's imbalanced, even as an Army guy, that, you know, General Austin's Army, and now the chair is Army, and now seven of 11 of the combatant commanders are Army? Yeah, I do worry that that's an imbalance to you. Obviously, it needs to be more than seven uh, Army guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, Hugh, I don't. In fact, I, I think, uh, given what you see uh, in uh, Ukraine right now, um, I think it, it's a smart choice to have someone with so much ground combat experience, someone who's experienced with um, the Europe uh, or the U.S. Army in Europe. I think that's a, a wise choice. And uh, I, I know that um, there's always a, a friendly rivalry between the services, but a lot of these positions turn over routinely on kind of a rotating basis. Um, and obviously there are other commands where you, know, you have uh, generals or admirals from the other services where it's more suitable to the train and the kind of fight you see, for example, uh, in the PACOM, which is traditionally a, a Navy command. Okay, now let me switch over to politics. Uh, President Trump endorsed Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. There's been blowback there. Coming up earlier in this hour, I had on Jane Timken. Yesterday I had on um, uh, J.D. Vance. After you, Matt Dolan, also running for the Ohio Senate seat, currently occupied by Rob Portman, will be coming on. Matt Dolan, up from the Cleveland area. Have you gotten involved in either the Pennsylvania or the Ohio race, Senator? I, I've not, you. Um, you know, I've tended to... Uh, um, get behind uh, this cycle, mostly young, young veterans running for the House, um, where I think they can use the most help um, to get off on the right foot. It's usually their first time in the, uh, in the race in these uh, large multi-candidate primaries. Um, I'm uh, confident the, vote, the Republican voters in those states are going to pick someone who's not only suited to their state, but also can win in November. Now, Dave McCormick is a veteran of the 82nd Airborne. He's older than you. He was in the 91 war, and you were in the 2003 war. He's got the bronze star. Is there, a, is there anything that recommends to you his sir? I mean, that would have him stand out in your mind because of that service? No, I, no, I know. Uh, simply because I haven't gotten involved in these races, Hugh, doesn't mean I'm not following them or don't know some of them. I know Dave well. I think Dave would be a fine senator. I, I know Carla Sands in that race as well. She's the former ambassador yeah. to Denmark. In Ohio, I, I know almost all of those candidates and think highly of them as well. Um, no, you're in my boat. Races. You're in my boat. Yeah. You just like them all. I, I, I follow the races closely. Uh, I'm not saying that I won't get involved in some of these races around the country as primary season progresses, um, but I'm confident the Republican primary voters in these states are focused uh, on the ultimate goal here, which is to make sure we have candidates who will win in November and then be strong senators for them in Washington. Last question, Senator Cotton. A couple of weeks ago, you said we'd all be better served if President Biden just stayed inside. And he has not heeded your advice. And we had this train wreck of a press conference on ghost guns and prostitution yesterday. It was just wild. Uh, any chance that anybody on the Democratic side is going to take the message to him because he's not going to listen to us that just stay inside? Well, pro probably not, Hugh. I mean, I do think it would be better for all involved to include the president. Um, but, uh, you know, he's been a, a voluble man for 50 years in Washington. And uh, once you get to be that age, you tend not to change your stripes, I guess. I uh, tell you, it's not a good mix. Senator Tom Cotton, thank you. Send Tom Cotton on Twitter. 
Welcome back, America. As I told you earlier in the hour and yesterday, the Ohio Senate GOP race is underway. It's so close. There are five people, any one of whom could win it, including my guest, State Senator Matt Dolan. His Twitter handle is at Dolan4, the number four Ohio. Hello, Senator. How are you? I'm doing great, Hugh. How are you? Actually, it's I am great. Dolan4, Ohio, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I put Dolan. Okay, Dolan for Ohio. Uh, Senator, I'm pretty sure you win this thing running away if Steve Kwan endorses you. Yeah, isn't that a fun start to the season? It is. He's, he, don't wake oh. the kid up for the benefit of other people. Right. It just goes to show you that sometimes big names aren't always the best. So it may be a little apropos for this uh, election. You know, well, just, bring us up to speed. Really hard, and we're going to win. Uh, bring us up to speed. I have not seen a poll of the race since March. I don't. Th I think pollsters have given up. They can't get a, a sample the right way. Early voting is underway. Jane Timken told me that earlier in the show. I didn't know that. How do you feel about the race? Well, nothing's changed, you since you uh, did that great debate the other in October. Undecided voter is still the biggest winner in this race. So it is, in fact, wide open. But look, when I travel the state, I know that Ohio families are hurting. I mean, we just heard this morning inflation is at 8.5%. That's up from 7.9%. That means Ohio families are being taxed by the Biden administration, $5,200 a family. I think what's resonating with them is I'm r running around the state talking to them about what we can do in Washington to, to confront today's crisis that the Biden administration is presenting to us. We also prepare for tomorrow's opportunities when we put conservative Republican ideas in place and we execute on them. I'm talking about energy. I'm talking about inflation. I'm talking about uh, giving parents you know, school choice. The things that President Trump talked about, I've actually done here in Ohio. So I, I think people are starting to pay attention to this race and realize there's one person in this race with the requisite experience, with conservative results, who's prepared to take on today's crisis caused by the Biden I'm talking with State Senator Matt Dolan, one of the five candidates running for the replacement of Rob Portman in uh, the United States Senate. Senator Dolan, in terms of get out the vote in this period of time where people can early vote, do you have an operation? I know you have a pretty good political team on the air. What about on the ground? So, Hugh, we have a great team. We put a plan in place when I got in this race in September, the last person to get in this race. We understood that we were going to peak at the right time. I am Uh, we've, we've lost putting together comforting is last night i had i spoke before 70 people in a in a in a town hall in toledo in which most of them were undecided voters and when they when they heard my message about what i want to do for them that i'm actually fighting i'm looking forward um it's starting to resonate so our campaign team is going to do necessary now, Senator, you and I have sent audio visual. I'm glad you're doing Skype because people like to see the candidates watching on the Salem News Channel. So I won't try and talk over you. Where does the election get won? I personally think it's Cuyahoga County because that's where every election gets won. But when Republicans go into Cuyahoga County and get votes, they win. How are you doing in Cleveland? Well, we're going to do well in Cuyahoga County. But look, we know where... The, the state, the Republican votes are in this state. We know where my message is resonating, and that, that map is expanding every day. So I'm very comfortable that we are targeting the folks that are going to go and vote uh, in this Republican primary and focus on the issues that I've been focused on. That's Ohio. I'm the only one talking about Ohio. I'm the only one resonating with families and workers who need job, who need workers, and we need training. These are things I'm talking about. The rest of my opponents are talking about they are looking backwards, and Republican voters are ready to look forward. Matt Dolan, the debates since I did one have kind of gone downhill. That's got nothing to do with me, and it got a lot to do with theater. And uh, I, I'm kind of astonished by them. Are there any more left? Uh, there are none scheduled, but that's a good word. It, uh, my opponents, it, it is about theater for them because they don't have a record to run on, so they're trying to out- anger somebody or outshout somebody when the reality is is when voters go to vote they want to know who's the rest of the nation crisis to get the supply chain moving again 
Who's going to fight for American independence and energy? Who's going to secure the border? Because as you heard me say before in October, and I'm still saying it, when Republicans were in charge in Washington, we did not get Trump's plan into law. He had to do it by executive order. That's because you send theater to Washington. I want to, I want to go to Washington to actually execute on ideas and get them done and help America be strong. Matt Dolan, in terms of Election Day versus the early, last question. Uh, will you show your strength mostly in pre-vote or on Election Day? Uh, I think most Republicans tend to vote late. Um, so I suspect that, uh, you know, I, I suspect Election Day will be most of the voters will come in. Uh, and I believe by that time, my message will have clearly resonated with the plurality of the Republican voters this March, uh, May. Well, that's interesting when you talk about peaking at the right time. I hadn't thought about that. But you do have to, right? I mean, it's a four-week election. It's, it's exactly right. Uh, good luck to you on Twitter. Dolan for Ohio online. Dolan, F-O-R-Ohio.com. Good to see you, Senator. Don't go anywhere, America. I'll be back tomorrow on the next Hugh Hewitt Show.